Part 10 of the Works of Sullust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Michael DeBrucker during the summer of 2009 in beautiful northwestern Pennsylvania. Works of Gaius Salustius Crispus. Translated by Alfred W. Pollard. Jugurthan War, Part 1. It's the unfounded complaint of mankind that they're naturally weak and short-lived, and that it's chance, not merit, that rules their destiny. So far is this from the truth, that consideration will show that nothing surpasses or excels our nature, and that it's rather energy that's lacking to it than power or length of days. It's mind that's the guide and commander of life in mortal men. Where this advances to glory along the path of virtue, its powers, resources, and renown are ample without the help of fortune. For uprightness, activity, and other good qualities, fortune can neither give nor take away. Where, on the other hand, it's become the slave of low passions, and has succumbed to sloth and bodily pleasures, a short submission to the fatal influence of lust suffices to fritter away strength, opportunities, and intellect, and idleness, and then the weakness of our nature receives the blame, and the doers charge circumstances with the defect that lies in themselves. Were men but as anxious in an honorable cause as they are zealous in the pursuit of matters of no concern or profit, and often even attended with danger and ill effects, they would be as much the masters as the slaves of destiny, and would attain to such a pitch of greatness as would make them, as far as mortal men may be, undying in their glory. Men are made up of body and soul, hence all their fortunes and passions follow in some cases the character of their body, and others that of their mind. Beauty of person and greatness of wealth with bodily strength and all other blessings of this kind are soon spent, but the noble achievements of genius are as eternal as the soul itself. Moreover, in the case of blessings of body or of fortune, as is the beginning, so is the end. They no sooner are risen than they begin to fall and decay from the moment of their prime. The mind is pure and eternal, itself ungoverned, as the guide of man, it moves and governs all things. Hence we may be the more astonished at the degradation of those who surrender themselves to bodily pleasures, and spend their life in luxury and sloth, while they allow the intellect, the best and noblest factor in man's nature, to become inert from indolence and neglect. And this, too, when the qualities of mind by which the highest renown may be won, are so many and diverse. Of these pursuits, however, magistracies and military commands, or in fact any share in the public administration, seem to me at the present time far from desirable, since the honors of office are refused to merit, while those who attain them either by knavery or force gain nothing in security, nor yet in distinction. To govern country or parents by force, even where such rule is possible, and is used for the correction of crime, is yet a grievous matter, especially when every revolution is the sure forerunner of massacres, banishments, and other horrors of war. On the other hand, to labor without result and seek no other reward for toil than unpopularity is the height of madness, except, perhaps, for those who are mastered by a disgraceful and fatal impulse to sacrifice their own honor and freedom to the power of a clique. Among the tasks that occupy the intellect, historical narration holds a prominent and useful place. As its merits have been often extolled, I think it's best to leave them unmentioned, and thus escape my imputation of arrogantly exalting myself by praise of my own pursuit, and yet I have no doubt that there will be some who, because I have determined to pass my life at a distance from public affairs, will apply the name of indolence to my long and useful task. At any rate, the men to whom it seems the height of energy to court the mob, and by favor by their public entertainments, will do so. These I would ask to remember the character of the men who were unsuccessful as candidates at the times when I obtained my several offices, and the class who subsequently gained admittance to the Senate. If they do this, they'll certainly consider that my change of determination was dictated by sound reason, rather than by sloth, and that more profit is likely to accrue to the state from my leisure than from the activity of others. I've often heard that Quintus Maximus, Publius Scipio, and besides these other illustrious citizens of our state, were wont to remark that as they gazed upon the effigies of their ancestors, their spirits were strongly stirred to the practice of virtue. It was not the wax or outward form, they said, that possessed this power, but the memory of gallant deeds that kindled a fire in the breasts of brave men that cannot be quenched until their own merit has rivaled their ancestors' fame and renown. 
As matters now are, is there a single man who doesn't prefer to vie with his ancestors in wealth and expenditure rather than in probity and energy? Even the men of no family, who formerly, when they won a victory over the nobility, won it by superior merit, now struggle into honors and commands by intrigue and violence rather than by honorable qualities, and seem to think that the praetorship, consulship, and other high offices possess an intrinsic renown and splendor, instead of being only esteemed according to the merits of their occupants. I've wandered, however, too far afield in my sorrow and shame at my country's degradation. I now return to my task. I'm about to write a history of the war which the Roman people carried on with Jugurtha, king of the Numidians, in the first place because it was a great and severe contest, waged with varying success, and in the second because resistance was then for the first time made to the pride of the nobility. And this struggle threw all things, both human and divine, into confusion, and reached such a pitch of fury that amid the passions of her citizens, war and devastation made an end of Italy. But before I set forth how these things began, I will touch on a few points of earlier history, that my whole narrative may be clearer and more open to the view. In the Second Punic War, in which the Carthaginian general Hannibal had inflicted the severest blow that the resources of Italy had received since the Roman power became supreme, Massinissa, king of the Numidians, was admitted to our friendship by Publius Scipio, whose merits subsequently gained him the title Africanus. He achieved many brilliant military successes, and after the conquest of the Carthaginians and the capture of Suffolk, whose rule was powerful in Africa and of wide extent, was rewarded by the Roman people with a gift of all the cities and lands which they had conquered. Thus favored Massinissa ever remained our loyal and honorable friend, and at last his authority and his life came to a common conclusion. After Massinissa's death, his son Macipsa, whose brothers Mastanabal and Galusa had been removed by disease, succeeded to the throne. He had two sons of his own, Adherbal and Himsal, and also reared in the palace, on equal terms with his own children, Jugurtha, his brother Mastanabal's natural son, who, on account of his birth, had been left by Massinissa in a private position. Powerful in frame and of handsome appearance, but especially remarkable for his mental ability, Jugurtha, on arriving at manhood, didn't abandon himself to the seductions of luxury and sloth, but took part in the national pursuits of riding and marksmanship, vied with his fellows in the race, and while surpassing all in glory, at the same time won every heart. He passed much of his time in hunting, and was the first or among the first to wound the lion and other prey. Yet, while thus prominent in action, he was the last to talk about himself. Jugurtha's behavior at first delighted Macipsa, who thought that his merit would add luster to his own rule. When, however, he marked his nephew in the prime of life ever rising in importance, while his own existence was now near its close, and his children were still young, he was greatly disquieted, and turned over in his mind many remedies. He was terrified as he thought of man's innate lust for power and rashness and indulging his heart's desire, and reflected, besides, how his own and his children's age offered the favorable chance which leads even unambitious men astray in the hope of gain. He saw, too, that the affection of the Numidians was kindled towards Jugurtha, and he was distracted by the fear that to make away with a man of such distinction might occasion riots or even war. Beset by these difficulties, he saw that a man who had so won the favor of his countrymen could not be crushed either by violence or craft, and since Jugurtha was ready of hand and eager for military renown, he determined to expose him to danger, and in this way to see if fortune would help him. In pursuance of this plan, Macipson sending to Spain a contingent of Numidian foot and horse, to the help of the Roman people in the Numantine War, placed Jugurtha in command of this force, in the hope he would meet his death, either in some display of his own courage or by the fierceness of the enemy. The issue, however, of his plans was very different to what he had expected. Jugurtha, such was the character and activity of his nature, had no sooner acquainted himself with the character of Publius Scipio, who was at that time in command of the Roman troops, and with the quality of the enemy, than by dint of exertion and forethought, by the most unassuming obedience, and by the frequency with which he exposed himself to risk, who had quickly won such distinction as to be the darling of our soldiers and the greatest terror of the Numantines, he achieved, indeed, that most difficult task of uniting vigor in battle with a sound discretion though the one in its foresight so often breeds terror, and the other in its boldness too rash a hardihood. The general was thus led to employ Jugurtha in nearly every task of difficulty. He ranked him among his friends, and daily became more attached to him as a man whose advice and enterprise were even attended with success. Jugurtha had also a generous temper, an attack by which he at once united many of the Romans to himself on terms of intimacy. Just at this time there were in our army many men, some of illustrious, some of undistinguished descent, with whom riches weighed more than virtue and honor, 
By their intrigues at Rome and their influence over the Allies, they had attained prominence rather than distinction, and now began to incite the aspiring spirit of Jugurtha by promises that, on the death of King Macipsa, he should have sole possession of the kingdom of Numidia. His own merit, they told him, was of the highest order, and at Rome there was nothing that could not be bought. At last Numentia was destroyed, and Publius Scipio determined to dismiss the contingents of the Allies and return home. After awarding the most distinguished presents and praises to Jugurtha in a public assembly, he took him apart to his own quarters, and there privately advised him to seek the friendship of the Roman people rather publicly than through individuals, and to avoid the habit of bribing anybody. It was a dangerous matter, he said, to buy from the few the favor which rested with the many. If he would be content to preserve in the exercise of his talents, glory and dominion would come to him of themselves. Should he hasten too eagerly to power, his own money would ensure his ruin. After this speech, Scipio dismissed him with a letter from Akipsa. Its purport was as follows. In the Numantine War, the merits of Jugurtha have been preeminent. At this I am sure you will rejoice. To me his services have so endeared him that I shall use every effort to recommend him as strongly to the Roman Senate and people. Receive my congratulations, as our friendship demands. In Jugurtha you have a kinsman worthy alike of yourself and of his grandfather, Massinissa. The king, on finding the reports he had heard thus confirmed by the general's letter, was impressed by both the merits of Jugurtha and the favor which he had won. He now changed his purpose, and endeavored to win him by active kindness, adopted him at once, and in his will appointed him his heir, on an equal footing with his own sons. As a child, Jugurtha, you lost your father and were left without hopes of fortune. I received you into the royal family under the belief that my kindness would make me as dear to you as though you had been my son, and the result has not disappointed me. To pass over your other great and noble exploits, quite lately on your return from Numandia, the glory you had won shed fresh luster on myself and my kingdom, and your merits drew our ties of friendship with Rome still nearer. You have renewed the fame of our line in Spain, and lastly, have achieved the hardest of tasks. You have conquered envy by your renown. Nature is bringing my life to an end, and now, by this right hand, the honor of a king, I warn and adjure you to hold dear these boys who are your kinsmen by descent, your brothers by my favor. Do not choose the novel friendship of strangers instead of maintaining the established alliance of blood. The bulwarks of the empire are not armies or treasures, but friends, and friendship can neither be compelled by force, nor won by money, but only by service and loyalty. And as friendship a closer tie than that of brother to brother, can you hope to find loyalty in a stranger if you turn traitor to your kin? My part is done in assigning my kingdom to you and them. If you act uprightly, it will be strong. If treacherous, you will find it weak. By omni, fortunes grow from small to great. By his court, the greatest melt to nothing. It becomes you, Jugurtha, rather than these boys, as their superior in years and wisdom, to guard against an ill result. For in every contest the stronger, even when attacked, is made by his greater power to seem the aggressor. For you, at Herbal and Yemsal, I bid you respect and esteem the great qualities of Jugurtha, Make his virtues your model, and strive that I may not seem more fortunate in the sign of my adoption than in those I have begotten. Jugurtha was aware of the hollowness of the king's words, and the views that occupied his own thoughts were very different. He made, however, a kind reply as the occasion demanded. A few days afterwards, Macipsa died. End of the Jugurthan War, Part 1 Recording by Scott Michael DeBrucker